global overview of trends in private, corporate, and government surveillance. Why am I going in that order? Because for me, responsibility for surveillance and our privacy or lack thereof starts with the individuals, goes up to the corporate sector, to the government sector, and ultimately resides back with the individual. Come on, next slide. So last night, at about 2 in the morning, I got an email from a colleague in the U.S. saying there's a debate going on on LinkedIn. Pew, uh, Pew organization did a survey. You know, choose privacy or security. What do you choose? And to me, that's the wrong question. That's like asking air or water. What do you need to live? <laughs> My answer is both, and occasionally beer and bourbon too. So, but that's not a, a, a complete answer. So I spent about two hours last night about between midnight and 2 a.m. researching this topic and just bringing data to the, to the topic. And why are privacy and security co-joined and not separate and binary? Anyone offer, who makes that choice for you or gives it a choice is lying. Because they're not asking the complete question. When you ask what privacy or, or security, it's privacy and security. Privacy for whom, from whom, and for how long? Because nothing stays secret forever. And security for whom, from whom, and under what context? Because again, 100% security is only available in the grave. So in the Western cultures, you know, there are three landmark documents. Until 1215, every emperor, king, and conqueror thought he had divine right. Mostly they were men, and they all thought either they were gods or descended from gods. And 1215 is the first time in Western history we have a document, the Magna Carta, that stripped the king of his divine right. We jump forward to 1628, where Sir Edwin Cook established in British common law that a man's home is his castle. That in 1791, the U.S. Bill of Rights, the Fourth Amendment, when you summarize it, protects us from unreasonable search and seizure. These three founding documents really lay the groundwork for the modern conversation on privacy and security. And what has happened over the last 200 years or so is through technology, through the growth of commerce and globalized cultures, technology and governments and societies have combined to turn our homes from our castles into virtual digital prisons. And the police can look, look through walls using IR infrared sensors. Yesterday I read a research paper out of MIT where they can detect where you are in your house based on Wi-Fi signals. This is the technology we used to use on prisoners. You know, ankle tracking and camera surveillance. Now every smartphone is a spy device. Every street corner has hundreds of thousands of cameras. And every one of you is a walking, talking spy. And you don't even know it. And you're not even getting paid for it. What's the real sad part? In the old days, spied, spies made a lot of money, and they're just like James Bond. Today, we don't get paid jack. But, wrong way. So first things first, since you're all educators, I invite you, there's a video I made about two years ago on what to teach the college kids and students in your life about social media and technology. I recommend you watch it. In fact, I recommend you make it mandatory that they all watch it. Just co you, all of us, as I look around the room, excluding my kids, all of us grew up in the age of privacy. We have some concept of privacy. If they're below the age of 25 tw today, they've never had a single moment of privacy. From the moment they were in the womb, they've been photographed. Look at Facebook today. What do people put up? Their pregnancy due dates. We're expecting a baby on certain so-and-so dates. The moment the baby is born, the first thing that comes out is a camera shooting thousands of photos. We put up, neonatal clinics are putting up websites of babies. What are they giving out? Name, date of birth, parents' names, city of birth, gender, mother's maiden name. How much more information do you need to commit identity theft? What more do you need to create a full profile? There are lots of people doing this. There's a cute game going on right now where young kids are opening up new Nintendo's new Xboxes and putting up pictures of unboxing their new game system. And there are adults who are looking at these pictures for their unlock codes to steal their game codes. This is happening around the world. So I invite you to watch this video and share it with the kids in your life because I, I, I made this based on years of research and I've heard from a number of parents and educators that the kids are now shutting down their Facebook accounts, are being more careful what they do online once they realize that they could lose jobs, get fired, not even be, not even be approved for jobs, 
or go to jail based on social media comments. Now, why does social media exist? Vanity. As human beings, we seek food, we, sh we seek shelter, we seek comfort, we seek to be heard. And social media is the biggest megaphone invented to date. We can all be have our 15 seconds of fame on the internet. <coughs> Write an incendiary blog post, put up a scandalous photo on Facebook. Look at the number of girls around the world, across cultures, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Islamic, you name it, who are sharing nude, semi-nude, and scandalous photos for that brief second of fame. Look at schools around the world, high school and colleges, where kids are sharing nude or semi-nude photos, which you think are private, but which actually have no legal protections from anybody. Not from governments, not from policemen, not from parents, not from stalkers. All for the quick 15 seconds of fame. How many of you saw the presentation in New York last year? Okay, only two of you are awake. Fantastic. It's a couple of things. You know what does Facebook say? Know your fr you know, friend, friend all your friends and neighbors? A small cruel gang in New Nashville, New Hampshire did exactly that two years ago. They friended all their neighbors. They kept track of who bought a new car, a new TV, new jewelry. And then when their Facebook status said, we're going to Florida, we're going to Helsinki, we're going anywhere not home, they went over and helped themselves to their, to their friends and neighbors' new possessions. National New Hampshire is a very small town, about 50,000 people, and over 100 bur bur 50 burglars are committed in a 90 day period. Social media makes the criminals' lives easy. It makes the policemen's lives easy. It makes our lives difficult. Separately, we all have, we all have cell phone cameras. All, every cell phone comes with a camera built in. I remember when phones used to be used for talking. Now I barely talk in mine. Email, texting, and photos seems to be 90% of the job. And every cell phone camera and every iPad and every iPhone automatically puts G GPS tags on your photos. They're automatically built in. They're really difficult to remove unless you're techno savvy. So last year an American broadcaster, a TV anchor, media star put up a photo online of a brand new truck that he got from Toyota for completing 100 episodes. Within five minutes his fans knew exactly where he lived because the photo he put up had the GPS coordinates of his house. That's every camera you've bought in the last 10 years. Every cell phone you've ever bought that takes photos does geotagging. Vendors make it easy for you to be spied upon. No camera manufacturer I've dealt with, no software I've ever seen that's commercially available or available to consumers lets you strip this data. Privacy loss is the default option. Choosing to be private requires a lot more work. Um, last, this year at New Year's Day, um, actually, I take that back. So in the US, legal age drinking is 21. And for a number of reasons, college universities are enforcing underage drinking laws. In this particular case, the university police, working with local police officers, set up a sting operation. Put up a Facebook posting of a lovely young lady inviting kids to have come to her, her the dorm room for a party. When the kids showed up, they didn't see a beautiful young lady. They saw cops who, who um, charge each of them $227 fine for enraged drinking and have some of them have criminal records. Just yesterday a story broke that a young man made a fairly stupid remark on Facebook. He was in a, in a, flame, uh, a flame war with a, a friend of his and he said he made some stupid remark about you know, when, coming over and killing people and something stupid idiotic related to video game they were playing together. He's now in jail looking at eight years of jail time and a half a million dollars in legal fees for one stupid comment. Close your eyes for a minute. Go ahead. Think back to when you were 14 to 18. How many stupid comments did you make <laughs> that your friends don't remember anymore? How many comments do you hope they never remember? Kids who are 25 and under will never ever have that privilege. Anything that they type, text, think. What do they do when they think? They think before they finish the thought, it's texted, blogged, or posted somewhere. A moment that occurs, it's recorded forever. I'm going to skip through that. So across uh, various cultures, we have the right of minors having privacy. In the US, if you're a minor under the age of 18, if you're involved in a crime, either as a victim or as a perpetrator, your name, your photos are withheld from the public unless they're extenuating circumstances. Australia has a similar rule. 
last, uh, 18 months ago, one of the um, broadcast stations took a 14-year-old uh, boy's pictures off of Facebook, broadcast them on national television. His parents sued for breach of privacy. And the Australian media regulator ruled, I'm sorry, we're sorry, if it's on Facebook, it's public data. It doesn't matter what your privacy settings say. You can mark the picture triple ultra secret pri private. If it's on social media, it's public knowledge. Now this is a fairly disturbing trend going on. As parents, we all take lots of photos. I have thousands of photos of my children. Thankfully, not all of them online. And in some cultures, certain photos are acceptable. In others, they're scandalous. And there are criminal organizations and businesses, and somehow I can't tell the difference between the two anymore, that are taking photos of young children, mostly young, uh, young girls, some young men, and even boys and infants and either using them unaltered or altering them and morphing them and putting them into uh, triple X-rated videos. So the photos you take of your children, your nieces, your nephews to tell the world how beautiful your kid is and they all look like Winston Churchill at some point are now being used in child porn overseas where it's perfectly legal. So if you don't want your kids and grandkids to become child porn stars, you might not want to publish their photos online. Share them with your friends and family. You know what? Print them out. Give people four by sixes. Putting them online leads to abuse. Be careful what you post. This is a fun one. So a woman was arrested for buying uh, illegal drugs, went to court, and she was busted by an undercover cop. So while she was in the witness uh, table, she or one of her colleagues took a photo of the police officer and posted it on Facebook. Now they're charging her with violating his privacy and I respect that. She should not have outed a police officer. Then you turn around, the next day I read a story that police departments across America are publishing academy graduation photos of police cadets. And it occurs to me, did the captains and the chiefs of police think for even 30 seconds about the long-term impact of posting academy graduate photos? Because you know some of these police officers, men and women, will go undercover. Some of them will be involved in drug deals and anti-terrorism cases. And you're proactively destroying their privacy. Because you know what? Today, if you take a photo right now, take a photo of anybody in this room, take a photo of somebody on the street, go to Google+, log into your Google Plus account, upload the photo, say search. If their photo exists anywhere on the internet, Google will tell you who they might be. So will Facebook. Facial recognition used to be very expensive military-grade technology. Today, we call it social media. Facebook, Instagram, Google, they're all doing facial recognition. The parts they make available to you for free as part of membership, and the parts they sell to governments and corporations for large sums of dollars. You know when Facebook came out photo tagging? Why did they come out photo tagging? To let you automatically recognize your friends and family? They got several billion hours of free labor from humans identifying faces. What did they do? create a separate for-profit subsidiary, which then sells facial recognition technology to open democratic governments like Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, Russia, China, and the US. So who helped create the surveillance state? We all did. I have clients who spent 30, 40 hours a week tagging photos. I have friends who spend their life tagging photos, not realizing five years ago the privacy they were destroying was their own. Um, when you're in college, what are the three most important things you look for? Free food, free alcohol, and money, right? Who, who, who of you had plenty of alcohol in college? Who of you had plenty of food? Who of you had plenty of money? If you raise your hand, sir, please adopt me. <laughs> Reality is when you're in college, you tend to be really hungry, looking for a free meal, and you're always short of money. There's a lovely bank in Hong Kong called Lendo, came out with a brand new product about a year ago advertised strictly to college students. If you get a loan through Lendo Bank, and as part of your sign-up process, you have to give them all your social media credentials, Facebook, Weibo, Gmail, LinkedIn, you name it. And their pitch is, if your friends, you know, we'll post for you on social, uh, we'll put a post for you. What a great deal we have. If your friend signs up, we'll give them a free toaster, we'll give them a better rate. And every, every friend who signs up, you get $25. And if enough of your friends sign up, you get a date with Jay-Z and Beyonce at the next concert. You can be at a private table with them. 
How many college kids do you know? How many of your students would, gi would jump, would, give, would sell a limb for an evening with Beyonce or Jay-Z? Most of them would. Here's what they don't tell you, buried in, this, in the contract, is if you are late, or if your friends are late, if your friends are deadbeats, or you're a deadbeat, they will use the same social media credentials to post to the world what a deadbeat you are. How many of you would willingly lend your friends money? How many of you know you're never going to get it back? <laughs> if you trust your friends, sir, could I borrow 100 bucks? I promise I'll pay you sometime. Good news is the rate of divorce is stable, at least in the U.S. and Canada. Bad news is every single year, the number of divorces citing social media, primarily Facebook, as the cause of divorce is increasing. So who is Facebook's favorite, favorite customer? Matrimonial attorneys. In the U.S., it's now automatic practice that if you go to a divorce attorney looking for a divorce, first thing they ask you for is a social media. First thing is your credit card, and if that doesn't bounce, your social media credentials. No lawyer wants to be surprised in court by what his client has on social media. And in a number of divorce cases that I've studied, judges now requiring that the separating couple have joint custody, not only of the children and the assets, but social media accounts. Neither one can use their social media accounts to harass, annoy, or defame the other or their friends. Whoever thought of social Facebook as a controllable asset? Uh, two quick case studies. Uh, a couple were going through divorce. Father wanted custody. Mother wanted custody. She swore in, co co uh, in court under oath that she is a very good mother, takes the kids to the beach, spends time with them. And on a particular weekend, she swore she was at the beach with her kids. Attorney, the husband's attorney knew better. He subpoenaed Facebook and World of Warcraft. And he was able to prove in court that while she claimed to be at the beach with her kids, she was playing World of Warcraft in Farmville with her boyfriend. Rule number one, don't lie to judges. Rule number two, really don't lie, lie to judges. In a separate case, a mother said she was a very clean mother, didn't smoke, didn't party, she really should have custody of children. And the opposing counsel said, Your Honor, look at her Facebook. There's pictures of her getting drunk and smoking marijuana or cannabis. Two plus two should add up to four in court. Gonna skip through that. This is going around around the world. Bobby Duncan is a college freshman and she had joined um, the queer chorus, a gay and lesbian chorus. And the choir, choir, choir director took photos of the entire chorus, put it up online. Her father found out she was lesbian before she told him. Her father's disowned her. How many times are you walking down the street? How many photos have you been in in this conference so far exposing relationships that you didn't want the world to know? Are you a Republican secretly attending Democratic uh, rallies? Are you a Nixonian or secretly attending World Bank me uh, conferences? Are you a leftist in a right-wing right underage drinking party? We're exposing relationships without even knowing about it. And it's innocuous, it's in complete strangers who are destroying their privacy or exposing these connections for ulterior mo motives, usually benign. This is happening around the world as well. Last year, the FBI came out with a big press release that busted a brand new terrorist cell using Facebook. Yay for the FBI, until you read the fine print. They had busted four young men for posting stupid rantings on Facebook. That was a complete evidence. No surveillance, no actual bomb ingredients, just idiot opinions on Facebook. I don't want to know how many, how many millions of my tax dollars were wasted for the FBI to get a big easy PR win from people who can't read, which would be most Americans. John McAfee, man inventing the antivirus industry. For about a decade, he was on the run. No one could catch him. This guy cost the opposing lawyers millions of dollars. He was the master at subterfuge. You tell him I'm in Helsinki, he's actually in Paris. Tell him I'm in Paris, he's actually in uh, Edmund Prague. And he sold his life rights to Vice Magazine. They put up this photo of him. They had exclusive world rights to his life story. Within 24 hours, he's arrested. Do you know how? Vice magazine forgot to strip the geotagging data off the photo. So while the photo said he's in Guatemala, he's actually in Belize, where he got arrested. Now here's a question I have not been able to answer. 
Did Vice make an honest human mistake? Or did, they, or did they intentionally leave the metadata in knowing that the moment he got arrested, their story became bigger? How many journalists are doing this right now knowing that by leaking secret information, they have a scoop? Now, I work in corporate security. We educate our clients on strong passwords, clean your desk, don't leave information lying around. How many of you teach, worry about your colleagues' children? Dell spends millions of dollars each year protecting the corporation. They spend $2.7 million a year protecting Michael Dell and his family. In a single 48-hour period, Michael Dell's kids destroyed $2.7 million in security spending. His daughter tweeted uh, on where she was going sh shopping that day for a high school reunion. And within 12 hours, his son uh, put a photo on Instagram called Billionaire Kids Breakfast, this gorgeous spread he was eating before flying a private jet to Hawaii. So as you talk about security and privacy, how many of you take into account not just your colleagues, their children, their spouses, their aunts, their uncles, who might expose data that should be, uh, that should be left private? My personal favorite? So last year, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, Randy Zuckerberg, Mark's sister, put up a family photo. She was supposed to direct message to somebody else. She accidentally Twittered it to the world. A reporter grabbed the photo, published it. And Randy Zuckerberg complained, it's not about privacy settings, it's about human decency. So apparently if Randy Zuckerberg, Mark's sister, can't figure out Facebook's privacy settings and can't get them right, what makes you think we can? Enough about individuals. Let's look at corporates. What are the corporations doing? So far we looked at the role of individuals. People being stupid, intentionally or unintentionally. This is corporations being malicious. So Facebook has a brand new product, now about a year old, called A Couple of Pages. Because their market share is tanking and their revenues are tanking, they're creating automatic pages for you. If your relationship status is not single, they're looking through all your photos and posts, automatically creating a couple of pages. And if you and your wife or your spouse are online, this might be okay. But what if the person you're in a relationship with is not the person you're legally married to? What happens when Facebook tags you with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your mistress, your boyfriend? Or accidentally tags you with somebody else with a similar name? What happens when they create family pages and company pages and start creating this data that didn't exist before based on metadata? So Facebook wants your phone number, so does Google, so does everybody else. Just a couple of months ago, an Indian researcher found that he could grab 500 million phone numbers out of Facebook because they apparently don't know how to lock face, uh, cell phone numbers down. 98% of Facebook users, he grabbed their cell phone number in a matter of days. Now how many of you have changed jobs in the last year? Last five years? Last 10 years? How many have kept the same cell phone number? Is that not your unique identifier? Is that not an identity for you? My, my number's not changed since 2001. It's not changing ever. I'll change jobs, I'll change companies. My number stays. My email address stays. And here's a company leaking it for you for absolutely nothing. The girls around me was an app that came and went like this. They had a big media splash and their pitch was, you download the app, and if a women's status on Facebook was not in a relationship, single, you could walk down the street with this GPS enabled in your phone with the app running, it would show you all the single women, women around you. How did it know this? Check their Facebook status, check the Foursquare status, married the two. There was a big media backlash, the company got shut down. You know what didn't get shut down? The data stream. Girls around me, the app died. Gays around me, Republicans around me, Democrats around me, shoppers around me did not. Both the Romney and Obama campaign used similar technology to entice their voters to call their friends to vote for them in the last election. Foursquare data feed hasn't been shut down. Facebook's status has not been shut down. Only thing that got shut down was this particular app. Now, SceneTap is a fairly nasty product. They went to bar owners and said, put, this, put these cameras in your bar, on the door and on the bar, and we'll help you get more business. Here's their pitch. When people download the app or go to the website, and you can walk down the street in most major cities now, and at least in the US, and see what's the demographic of the bar. 
What's the age ratio, male to female ratio? What are they drinking that night? So the bar can put out a quick promo. You know what? We're having a sale on margaritas, sale on Mai Tais. You can look at the bar and say, you know what? It's full of college kids. I don't want to go there. It's full of way too many guys. I'm not going there. But in the process, all the demographic data they're collecting, their terms of service are completely scandalous. Who owns that data? Not you. The days of walking to a smoky bar for the private conversation, gone. Now, governments. So India has a small problem. Small country, about the size of Texas. Large population, lots of people living in very, very poor circumstances. And mass amounts of money is stolen by politicians, policemen, and corrupt middlemen that should go to the, to go to the poor. So they started a couple of years ago building the largest biometric database in the world so that they could deliver public services to the poor properly. Like most government projects, it's built by the lowest bidder. And when they asked the minister in charge of the product, what about the privacy and security of the system? Her response was, these people don't care about privacy, they live 12 to a room. Understandable. Her job is to get more money from the government to the poor they can feed themselves, send their kids to school. But no one's looking at 20, 30 years down the road when these kids grow up and they are in college, they're working, and their biometric data, you know, you lose your password, you can change it. They lose your eyeball data, you don't get replacement eyeballs. If they lose your fingerprint data, you can't get new fingerprints. These things don't change. And the security in the system is built by the lowest bidder. That should make you feel really comfortable right about now. And by the way, at completion, the Indian database will be 128 times the US Department of Homeland Security's database. 128 times. This amount of storage is almost unparalleled. UAE last year applied for an award. They wanted to be declared the world's largest biometric database built by government. IS, the Open Democratic Republic of the United Arab Emirates, a defender of civil rights and freedom and privacy. When it comes to governments, I believe Oscar Benavidez said it correctly. For my friends, anything. For my enemies, the law. <laughs> now the most important law on the internet is the American ECPA, Electronic Communications Privacy Act of 1986. Why? It's the governing law of the American Republic and by the extension, the internet. It states that any email held in an online provider that's over six months old or opened has zero days of privacy from the American government. Zero. Any information in an online database has zero rights to privacy from law enforcement. This law is 26 years old. If it was a human, it would have a mortgage and 2.3 kids by now and probably a bad university track record. And using this 26-year-old law, an FBI agent went rogue and took down the head of the CIA, the second most powerful and the second richest intelligence agency in the world. If the head of the CIA cannot be protected from a rogue FBI agent who's on a personal vendetta, not legally sanctioned, not authorized by management, just on a personal vendetta. That should make you feel really comfortable right now about using Gmail and Facebook and most internet services. As we know from the last couple of years, Patriot Act has global reach. We're in Helsinki, we're part of the EU. You guys have a great Charter of Human Rights and really good documents on privacy. Here's a loophole. If you use any American providers, Microsoft, Amazon, Azure, Rackspace, any American telecoms providers. Your information is owned by the NSA and by the FBI. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip all of that. This is one of my fun stories. The Saudis of interesting culture. Women are property of the men. You're property of your father. When you become married, you're property of your husband. If your husband dies, you're the property of either his brother or your son. The child you raised is now your legal guardian. And they have a fun culture that says, when a woman leaves the country, the government proactively notifies the male guardian. So without telling their citizens, 
they came with a brand new product about year, two years ago. And a husband found out about it completely by mistake. His wife boarded an airplane, he got a text message. Your wife has left the country. He's like, when did this happen? How did this happen? I didn't sign up for the service. He didn't. The government automatically opted in every male guardian into the system. Ponder that next time you travel to Saudi Arabia and your gender is not male. In the old days when police needed data, they would have to go to a judge and say, I want data on Roger Goyle's cell phone, his home phone, his work phone. Now they've gotten lazy and smart at the same time, which is scary to a cop. They don't ask for individuals anymore. They go to cell phone companies and say, give me the data for everybody. Give me the complete tower locks. Occupy Wall Street, Lower Manhattan. Two million people work within one mile of Occupy Wall Street. Two million people. Whether you worked there, you were a protester, you were a tourist, you were a reporter. It didn't matter to the cops. They said, give us all the data. And they're not alone. You, every police department in the world is going to cell phone carriers and saying, just give us the tower locks. Give us everything. We'll search it for you. No, we'll search for you. Just give it to us. When London had the riots two years ago, without being asked, RIM, the maker of BlackBerry, voluntarily dumped all the chat data, the BBM data, in the riot zip codes to the police, no questions asked. Can I skip through that? So Australia is a great privacy law. Any Aussies here? Leon, you'll like this. The Aussies have a great privacy law. And in violation of the Constitution, the Australian spy police and the spy agencies were illegally spying on email, web, exactly what the NSA is doing. They've been doing it for years too. They're not as good as the NSA. And last year, the Department.